you all. Uh, thank you for coming out tonight, this afternoon. Um, tonight I'll be talking about envy to zeal. And while, while we start, I like to define these words. And as we see, envy is a desire felt by a person when they lack a quality in their life uh, that someone else has. And then zeal is a great energy or enthusiasm, another desire in pursuit of a cause or an objective. So here we can see that these two words, they're linked together because they're both desires. And I also looked up the word envy on the Blue Letter Bible app, which is a Bible app on your phone. and has a lot of good resources, and it defines words and all. And it gave envy two definitions. One of them was a passion of anger, a passionate anger towards someone, as we see in the story of Cain and Abel and Saul and David, or a passion of zeal, a passion or drive towards a goal or cause, as we see in see in Paul and David. And so we see that these two different definitions of the word envy, and whenever I see these, see envy, I, I, I put it together with the passion of anger, uh, mostly. And a story with that anger, or with that definition, is the popular story of Cain and Abel. In Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, it states, Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time it came to pass that, that Cain brought an offering of fruit to the Lord. Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but unto he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. And so here we can see it's the beginning of the story of Cain and Abel. They are children of Adam and Eve, uh, Abel was being a herdsman, and Cain being a farmer. Uh, they went up and, give, and gave an offering to the Lord, and God respected Abel's offering, but he had no respect for Cain's offering. And the reason why God had no respect for Cain's offering is what I came to find that was not of flesh and blood. If we look at Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And so, when giving... Um, these sacrifices, if you look at Leviticus, like 90% of the sacrifices required a living, a living sacrifice, a lamb or a goat. And the other uh, accounts weren't very, uh, of them not giving a living sacrifice wasn't very, um, it didn't happen a lot. And so, and so since Abel didn't give, he didn't meet the standard, that sacrifice wasn't respected with God. And so he didn't respect it. And there is, there's a lot of other uh, reasons why. Like one of the reasons I've been told is because he didn't put forth an effort. But I don't really think that's true because he had to grow that crop. He had to tend it. He had to weed it. And so I don't think it was a lack of effort but just not meeting the standards that God had for him. And this not having the respect of God, uh, we see the effect it has on him in verse 5. And it states, but he did not respect Cain in his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. And so... We can see that this is envy that he's dealing with because in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 30, it states a sound heart is life to the body, but envy is rottenness to the bones. And so it's not saying that is literally rotting his bones. The way I like to think about it is if you have a sound heart, you have everything you want, then you're, you're living happy, you're well, and you're healthy. But when you envy and you notice that there's something that you don't have and there's something that you're missing that someone else has, you desire that, and, you, and all you want is that one thing, but you don't have it. So it's practically rotting your bones. And God, he sees this in Cain. He sees this in Cain in verses 6 and 7. It states, So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin lies at the door, and its desires for you, but you should rule over it. And so God noticed Cain is being upset, and here we will kind of find the the two uh, main ideas of our lesson. And God goes to Cain and he asks him what happened and God gives Cain two choices. Cain could either do well uh, and be accepted or do not well and have sin and allow a sin to have that chance to rule over him. We can see that we also have these same choices that God gave Cain. When we uh, are faced with sin, we could choose to do well or we could choose to do not well. So what did Cain choose to do? Uh, in verse 8, it states, Now Cain talked with Abel's brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against his brother and killed him. Now, I hope we know that that is not what you're supposed to do. Uh, um, and we see that Cain chose to do not well. He let sin lie at the door and eventually broke in and took over him. 
This led to Cain having such a passionate hate towards Abel that he rose up against Abel and he killed him. And that absolutely fabbles my mind because I have two brothers and I've, I've, we got gotten in a lot of fights, but it wasn't to the point where I brought a rock upon his head, you know. So that just blows my mind that, that Cain did that to his brother. Uh, but Cain hasn't been the only person who's let this envy overtake them with his passionate hate towards someone else. In 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 8 through 9, it states, And Saul was very angry, and the saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed only thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? Saul, I, David, from that day forward. And so this is the story of Saul and David. And here we could see that Saul's envy towards David has sparked. And this feeling is sparked because David, he was, he was a farmer, he was a herdsman. He took care of his father's sheep. And he went out and he slayed Goliath. And he slayed multiple other Philistines too in battle. And the people began, began to favor him and like him. And so they'd sing songs about him. And one of the songs said that David's killed ten thousands and Saul's only killed thousands. And Saul is the king. So he's pretty successful too. But, uh, and, I kinda, and this kind of shows how, in, how envy can be petty. And it doesn't matter who you are, but you can still envy Saul was upset when he'd only killed thousands of people, and David killed ten thousands. Saul was upset even though he was very successful. So no, no matter how successful you are, you could still envy others. And whenever uh, we we kind of saw in Cain and Abel, whenever people get overwhelmed with this hate towards another person, we could then see that they try to take them out, as Cain did with Abel. Saul will also do to David, and we see this in First Samuel chapter eighteen, verse eleven. It states, and Saul cast his spear before he said, I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped his presence twice. So Saul not only tried to kill him once, but it said that David had escaped his presence twice. And then since he couldn't physically kill him himself, in uh, 1 Samuel 18, verse 17, it states, For Saul thought, let my hand not be against him, but let the hand of the Philistines be against him. And so since Saul couldn't kill him himself, he put him on the front lines of the armies and tried to get the Philistines to do his dirty work for him. And as you, as you read, on, read along in this story, you'll see that David has had these opportunities to kill Saul. But And as we've covered these two stories about the topic of envy, I hope that we could see that there's some steps that both Cain and Saul went through when going through this feeling. Uh, as we look at these steps, I hope that we could try to realize them in ourselves. Uh, and look, uh, I hope that we could look at what happened to them so we can also realize when we fall in this trap and then fix ourselves. And so this first step would be a person has something that you want or desire. It all starts out with someone desiring another's possessions or relationships. Cain wanted Abel's respect from God, and Saul wanted the people's love. And then the second step is then you become mad and upset. Once Cain didn't have God's respect, he grew angry and his countenance fell. And when Saul didn't have the heart of the people, he despised David. And then with them being mad and upset, uh, you might try to harm the person physically or emotionally. This anger you form can then lead you to violence Cain killed Abel and Saul tried to kill David. And it might not be always physical either. Whenever you envy someone, you could just tend to be mean to them or think less of them. And for an example, we, were, we had a track meet Friday and there's a school Edmund Memorial and they have some pretty fast sophomores and I wish I was as fast as them. And one of these fast sophomores was running the mile and he was losing and I'm like, ha ha, slow poke. And that's not really, like you shouldn't act that way towards a person and you shouldn't, or you might tend to think of a person less whenever you envy. And so when you follow these steps, uh, they tend to have effects. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 8, it states, Now Cain, Cain talked with Abel, his brother, 
And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel's brother and killed him. So here we could see that envy can affect the relationships we have with people for the worse. Now again, it might not be the part where you kill the person, but it could definitely like harm the relationship because if you treat that person any less, they're going to treat that relationship with you less. Another effect is in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1-3. through 3, And it states, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? So being envious can hold us back from growing in Christ. Um, this verse is Paul talking to the people at Corinth, and, what, and he says that they aren't ready for meat of the word, but only milk. And the reason uh, why is because they're still doing carnal things, and like it says, these carnal things that they're doing is one of them is envying. And so we, if we envy people, it can make us not be able to go forward in Christ. And... Galatians chapter 5, verse 21, it states, Envy, murderers, drunkenness, revilers, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Finally, here we can see that if we envy, it can also impact our relationship with God. And as we see these symptoms in our life, we need to try to do what is right, as God told Cain in Genesis 4-7. But what is right? If you, if you remember, uh, we talked about the definition of envy. And if you recall, it, we it said that it had two definitions, and one of them was to have a passion of anger, but there was also the passion of zeal. And so what I gathered is to uh, do good is to... Um, zeal's definition is a great energy, passion, or pursuit towards something. And so to do right is to focus on God's work and not the person's work that you envy. And as we apply this, I kind of narrowed thought that there's two types of envy in the world. There was envy in the fleshly world, as Saul envied David to do his worldly fame, and then envy in the spiritual world, as Cain envied Abel due to his relationship with God. And so as we deal with envy in the fleshly world, uh, first Colossians chapter 3, verses 1-2 through two states, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sit." where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above and on the things of the earth. So this verse here states that we should seek the things which are above. If we seek those on earth and envy the people that have these earthly things, it could lead to our demise. Um, for example, Saul got tunneled vision to where he could only see what he didn't have in the world, which was the people's um, praise, instead of focusing on God and realizes that it, there's a lot more to just that stuff in the world. And then while we have this zeal and when we apply it, it can provoke others. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 2, it states, For I know your willingness, about which I boast of you to the Macedonians, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal has stirred up the majority. So here is Paul referring to the people in Corinth and about how they had this zeal and how they were ready to show the word, but they just weren't quite there yet. But uh, Paul still boasted about their zeal that they had. And I've kind of had this happen to me personally, and I'm not really the most knowledgeable whenever it comes to God's word, but just being around people who are, like David Minson, um, Levi Richardson's one, he's a, he's a young evangelist in training, like in Tennessee and Kentucky, uh, and people from just youth groups that I've met, like Cole Goodman and Quinn Hayes, and just so many good and young people, they've inspired me to become more knowledgeable in God's word and to be able to spread it. So whenever we have this zeal, it will provoke others. And now we come to envy in the spiritual world. Uh, Galatians chapter 6 verse 4 states, But let each other examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. To become the best we can in God's word, we should focus on our work and prove ourselves. If we look at ourselves and see what's wrong and what we need to fix, then we could see that we envy other people and attack before it, again, before it begins. But when we are proving ourselves, uh, and when we are proving ourselves, we won't be looking at others and getting caught up with what we don't know or have. And a good example of this I, I, uh, I found was Acts chapter 18, verse 24 through 28. 
And it reads, Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This, uh, this man has been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spoke and taught accurately of the things of the Lord, even though he only knew the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, and when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he desired to cross Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting his disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace, for he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is Christ. And so here we could see that this is a story about a Jew named Apollos, and he's preaching his interpretation of the word, but it uh, wasn't very accurate or it wasn't up to date. So Aquila and Priscilla heard this, and they took him aside, and they corrected him, and they informed him. And instead of being all furious about this correction and started to envy uh, Priscilla and Aquila for their, for their knowledge of God, Apollos instead uses it and applies it and focuses, on, uh, focuses and corrects his work. And we see that it has improved because it said that he greatly helped those who believed through grace, for he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly. And so whenever I was working on this lesson, I kind of realized that whenever we focus on our work, uh, I feel like it could have been very easy to think yourself better than another person because you've put more time into your work than they might have and to become proud. But uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 states, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each other esteem others better than himself. So as we work, we shouldn't do it to prove ourselves better than a person or to make ourselves better than a person. Uh, we should do it because that's what we're supposed to do. That's what God calls us to do, and that's the right thing to do. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, verse 14 through 22, it states, For in fact the body is not one member but many. If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the ear should say, Because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But God has set the members, each one of them, and the body, just as he pleased. And if there were all one member, where would, be, uh, where would, where would the body be? But now indeed there are, many, there are many members, yet one body. And I cannot say the hand of the feet, I have no need of you nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members in the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And so this passage says a lot about the, the importance of all of the people in the church. Uh, it states that the church isn't made of one body, uh, one body but many. And so each part plays an equally important role. Uh, just because you could do something better than another person doesn't mean you are more important to them. Uh, like the like the passage said, um, if if every person could would do the exact same thing, then there would be no body. Uh, if all the church were were Mike Minson's, then where would be the Matt Panels? And if they were all the Matt Panels, then where would be the Jonathan Minson's? You know. And so, for a working church, we need everyone to be a part of it. And there's no need to envy someone else for a skill that you don't have, because God has given you an important part. Uh, to play too. So there again is uh, no need to be envious of something a person has um, because again God has given you some incredible talents that they